Well, good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of Preservation Virginia and Patrick Henry Scotchtown Museum, I would like to welcome you to the uh, Archaeological Discoveries at Scotchtown webinar. My name is Dawn Burnett, and I am one of the site coordinators at Patrick Henry Scotchtown Museum, located in Hanover County, Virginia. I would like to thank everyone joining us today. Your support of this event greatly uh, is greatly appreciated and directly impacts our ability to continue future programming. Um, as Leah mentioned, we would uh, ask for you to put your uh, information in the chat box, but also use that as a place for questions. Um, at the end of the program, we uh, we'll have some time to do a Q&A and we'll be able to pull some of the questions from that. While today's subject is certainly near and dear to my heart, uh, it is a webinar, just one in a long series of programs that Preservation Virginia has shared over the past year. Uh, these programs can be found on our YouTube channel and I encourage you all to look there. Um, for this program and for uh, others that uh, will support Preservation Virginia. I have the privilege today of introducing you to our speakers um, and sharing a brief uh, Cliff Notes version of Scotchtown's history. Our speakers are both experienced historians who have thoughtfully and carefully studied the pieces in Scotchtown's collection of artifacts. First, you will hear from Leah Lane, who has been the curator of collections here at Preservation Virginia for the past year and a half. Prior to that, she worked as an assistant curator uh, at the Cincinnati Art Museum. Leah has a BA in history from the University of Virginia and an MA from the University of Delaware's Winterthur Program in American Material Culture. Next, Dr. Elizabeth Fisher will share her findings Dr. Fisher teaches archaeology at Randolph-Macon College in Ashland, Virginia, where she is the Shelton H. Short III Professor in the Liberal Arts. Professor Fisher earned her BA at the College of William and Mary, her MA at Florida State University, and her PhD at the University of Minnesota. Well, the name Scotchtown immediately brings to mind the place where Patrick Henry made his home in the infant days of the revolution. However, this property, along with the archaeological discoveries found on it, reflect a multi-layered history. On July 15, 1717, Charles Chisel received a grant for 9,976 acres of new land in Hanover County. From Lord, Go Lord Governor Alexander Spotswood. Tradition states the initial construction of the house was completed by 1719, expanded by the hands of enslaved craftsmen. Chisel and his wife Esther moved to the new property and in addition to agricultural production would establish an iron manufactory nearby. Chisel would die in 1737, and the property was transferred to his son, Colonel John Chisel. In 1759, the property was transferred to Chisel's son-in-law, Don Robinson. And interestingly, it's about this time that we uh, have the first reference of the name Scotchtown being used. A few years later, in 1766, Colonel John Chisel was involved in a scandal. He murdered a man by the name of Robert Rutledge at Mosby's Cavern. Chisel would uh, mysteriously die, uh, went out on bail, and was refused burial in Williamsburg. Amid public outcry, his body was brought back to Scotchtown, however, for burial. In that same year, Robinson dies deeply indebted to the state. And in order to pay some of Robinson's debts, uh, Scotchtown was offered up for public sale and eventually sold at auction in 1770. Patrick Henry, his pregnant wife, and their five children would take occupancy of Scotchtown in 1771. And though he only owned the home for a few years, until 1778, as a matter of fact, they were some of the most politically 
significant years of both his life, our country's future, and the 40 enslaved men, women, and children who lived and worked on this property. In March 1775, a newly widowed Patro Patrick Henry would ride the 40 miles from Scotchtown to Richmond, and it was at St. John's Church that he would deliver the speech he is well known for, give me liberty or give me death. That speech would become the rallying cry for independence. In 1776, Henry was elected the first governor of the Commonwealth of Virginia, and he would re relocate his family to the governor's palace in Williamsburg. The following year in his second term, he would marry his second wife, a woman by the name of Dorothea Dandridge, and they would grow the family to 17 children. Scotchtown is yet again put up for public auction in 1778 and is sold to Wilson Miles Carey. He would in turn sell it in 1787 to Benjamin Forsyth. In 1801, Scotchtown is sold yet again to a gentleman by the name of John Mosby Shepherd, who along with his descendants and the Taylor families would live at the property until it was transferred in 1958 to APVA, the Association for the Preservation of Virginia Antiquities, today known as Preservation Virginia. It is incredible to think that this was just 63 years ago that this all happened. Hanover County branch of APVA uh, oversaw the initial restoration of the house and the grounds undertaken by a gentleman by the name of Walter Macomber. Mr. Macomber certainly brought with him an impressive resume, having served as resident architect for Williamsburg, Mount Vernon, and by playing lead roles in restoration projects at sites such as Stratford Hall. It is now my pleasure to turn the program to our first speaker, a lady from whom I have learned so much in the past year, Leah Lane. Well, thank you, Don. That was a fabulous introduction to the site and its back history. And it's been an absolute pleasure working with you for the last year and a half. So give me just a second. I'm going to do the old screen share, um, which should be very quickly up. All righty. Let's get this rolling. All right. So, when Preservation Virginia acquired Scotchtown in 1958, no archaeology had been conducted at the site. It was, to be honest, a veritable barn with a goat that kind of watched over the grounds. Throughout the 1960s, the APVA pursued a flurry of restoration and building activity. The work was also part of the initial development of Scotchtown as a public site but it anticipated the coming of the bicentennial celebrations in 1976. Today, we'll be taking a look at a series of excavations that took place in this early development of Scotchtown as a historic site, especially the digs from 1968 to 1975. When Scotchtown was purchased by the APVA, there were no surviving historic outbuildings. This is an image from the 1930s taken during the Historic American Building Survey. Um, so it's a little bit earlier, but it already shows how the landscape has kind of been denuded of those. So there's no kitchen, there's no laundry, there's no well house. None of the support buildings that were critical to a functioning 18th and 19th century plantation and were key sites of the labor of enslaved individuals. We know that there must have been such structures there. By 1802, we have this, which is a mutual assurance policy. It's kind of a type of insurance with a sketch of the workyard. And this includes, and I've added some little labels here, a kitchen, a laundry, and a barn, in addition to the main house. The Henry period of occupation might have had a different arrangement or different buildings themselves, but it was probably something similar to this. And we do think it was on this north side of the house. So restoration architect Walter Makehomer, which who Don mentioned just a minute ago, he was also asked to build some freestanding um, outbuildings um, 
on the locations on this map. So he ended up putting a wall office where you see the laundry and um, where the barn is labeled, he actually built a little caretaker's cottage. He was aided in trying to understand what these buildings might have looked like by this amazing document, which is an 1820 plat. It's illustrated and it was done by a man named J.D.G. Brown. And um, it's a little hard to tell from here. So I've added this little overlay and that shows um, some of the buildings that are illustrated on this plat. Now Brown did an additional small watercolor of Scotchtown that also illustrates two of the main buildings and it's in a little better condition. Having visual documentation is one thing, but understanding how they actually fit within that landscape is a very different reality. In 1962, Make Homer tasked his crew with digging an exploratory trench that went around the yard to try to find the foundations of these buildings, um, which is how he actually ultimately chose the sites for the buildings he, he built, the reconstructions. Now, unfortunately, there was no archeological study done prior or during these projects, and they left um, no record of any artifacts uncovered during their digging, and there almost certainly were some. All of this makes doing modern archaeology at Scotchtown especially challenging. The evidence in a large portion of the landscape has been disturbed or destroyed by generations of plowing, a bulldozer, or a lack in documentation. It was actually another construction project that spurred the first true archaeological study at Scotchtown. As you can see on this mutual assurance plat, um, the building here on the right is labeled kitchen. Now, leaders of the Hanover County branch wanted Maycomer to design and construct a usable kitchen, something they could use in their interpretation. But it wasn't exactly clear that this was the location of the kitchen in Henry's period of occupation, which is what they're interpreting. Now, Virginia Shaw English, who's a little bit of a hero of mine, um, she was a very passionate member of the branch, and uh, she approached uh, young Alistair MacDonald about doing a small dig in the proposed kitchen location to better understand what might have been there. MacDonald had been training under noted archaeologist Ivor Noel Hume and had worked on digs at the Getty House and Weatherburn's Tavern in Williamsburg. Now he agreed to take on the job and he assembled a crew of friends and colleagues and here is the wages they were paid in that year. Uh, so you know $1.60 per hour for your, your digging. Uh, so very reasonable but again it's, it's 1968. <laughs> so thank you. So despite rampant poison ivy and a pesky unidentified allergy, uh, the group worked through the heat of July 1968. What they found was not exactly what the branch had hoped for. This was not the site of an 18th century kitchen. McDonald actually found two foundations for kitchens that were built on top of each other. A stone one, uh, which is a top that was circa 1820, 1825, and an earlier brick one, uh, which also postdated the Henry occupation. And that one had this yellow clay floor. And what you see here is a schematic drawing that shows kind of the, the layout of those different foundations um, and a general plan. And you also see that trench cutting across there. That's the Maycomer print, trench from 1962. So he also identified a privy. It's kind of there in the center of your, um, of the plat there. And Based on some ceramics, we were able to say that this is probably mid 19th century, and it means that likely the kitchen was no longer standing by that point. So it's a pretty tight narrow of its existence. So like I said, archaeologists often use ceramics to help date features um, that they find during their excavations. Um, as the type of the type of wares and their decoration, they change over time. So for example, McDonald found these sizable fragments of a circa 1840s English uh, uh, transfer printed dish, and that was in the privy context. So we know that um, they were deposited there sometime after 1840s. Another object that he found that was datable uh, is this portion of an English clay pipe stem. So archeologists can measure the size of the bore or that opening through the stem. And that's a useful guide for approximating a production date, in this case, circa 1720 to 1750. Now, despite the outcome of the excavation, the kitchen was reconstructed at this location. The desire for a useful interpretive space outweighed the evidence in this case. Scotchtown's leadership was determined to have the site in prime condition for the arrival of the bicentennial, 
and compromises on accuracy were made in pursuit of that useful final product, which we still use. <laughs> now, I had the distinct pleasure of chatting with Alistair McDonald recently, and he fondly recalled his time working at Scotchtown. He did note that his efforts to document the excavation were thwarted a little bit by a thief uh, who stole his camera and his camera bag with all of those in-process excavation photos. So that's why we don't have those for this dig. Now, although his career ultimately took him in a different direction, McDonald has continued to pursue his passion for archaeology through his work on Fort Raleigh and with the First Colony Foundation. It's worth noting too, that Mr. McDonald has been a life member of Preservation Virginia since age 18. So he got an early start with things. At the same time as McDonald's kitchen um, excavation was coming to a close, another restoration project was heating up. One that occasioned more archeological work at Scotchtown. The Garden Club of Virginia agreed to develop and install an appropriate landscape design around the main house. Now, there is one description of a garden at Scotchtown. It just slightly postdates the Henry occupation period. Baron von Closen observed in, during a visit in 1782 that, quote, an English garden below adds a great deal of charm to the estate, end quote. The Garden Club hired archaeologist Barbara Liggett to look for clues to how the landscape might have appeared during the 1770s. Though so Liggett was clear that the informality of an English garden wouldn't translate well to archaeological evidence, she did seek to un better understand the built landscape that was threatened by the installation of the new design. These 1969 and 1970 excavations focused on about a 150-foot radius around the north side of the house. So again, we're talking about the workyard side. They started probing the landscape for hits on possible buried features. But unfortunately, most of what they hit was our infrastructure. <laughs> they broke the sewer line, the water line, and the electric line to our well pump, which you can see pictured here. So, one, all, in, all in pursuit of good information. So one might categorize much of the archaeology at Scotchtown as a process of elimination. And that was certainly true for the Liggett excavations. Harvard Ayers, who served as the site leader during the project, uh, I think he said it best. He said, quote, Scotchtown is not a simple, neat, tightly clustered arrangement of the main house and dependencies, rather a hodgepodge of earlier and later features. Scotchtown's constellation of buildings just didn't really match with what we expected from the period. The Liggett Ayers excavation did uncover a number of datable artifacts, including a large fragment of a molded edge pearlware platter. This shell edge design with bright glazed rim and bluish overall cast begins to appear in the archeological record about 1780. So we know it's probably a post-Henry uh, uh, object. But interestingly, and I know we have uh, someone who's involved with Red Hill on here, but we know, so Red Hill was Patrick Henry's retirement home, the last home he owned. And there was an inventory done at his death. It's called a probate inventory. Uh, so that's 1799. And there are um, similar ceramics to this listed in that probate inventory. So it was really popular in Virginia and in the colonies in general. Nearby, archeologists discovered the majority of this wine bottle in this photo from the excavation, uh, Fred Wilbur is working to remove the bottle from that surrounding dirt. And based on the shape of the pushed up underside, which is what we call the kick, the bottle could be dated to about 1790. Now, these two uh, finds were made in the context of a drainage ditch, which was ultimately filled in during the 19th century. So they reveal a glimpse of the 18th century materials in use at Scotchtown, but they don't tell us much about the arrangement of structures or the labor of the enslaved in that workyard during the Henry occupation. Several fragments of tin glazed earthenware, which is sometimes called delft, were also discovered during these excavations. This piece shows that characteristic loss to the glaze, which tends to cleave off of the, the clay body. And it's shown next to an intact 18th century ointment jar, now at the Victoria and Albert Museum. The undecorated piece found at Scotchtown, it might have been from a similar utilitarian form. 
The 1969 Liggett dig also revealed this fragment of an English uh, glass, which might have been part of a 1770s or 1780s wine glass, similar to the one you see pictured um, in full and on detail on either side of this slide. And I just love the stylized tulip design that goes around the border. Around. So Liggett continued to supervise work in 1970, and this time it was actually carried out on the ground by John M. Young. And this was mostly around the foundations of the house, which were very disturbed by the restoration pro process earlier in the 1960s. So they were really looking at the foundations of the house and how they had changed over time. And by this point, work was starting on the landscape that Ralph Griswold had designed on behalf of the Garden Club, the initial concept for which you can see illustrated here. So further excavations were ultimately limited to observing the, uh, the objects brought to the surface during the installation process. Barbara Liggett and Harvard Ayers both went on to have long careers in the field. Liggett is best known for her excavations of Franklin Court, which was Benjamin Franklin's house in Philadelphia. And Ayers is a professor emeritus of anthropology at Appalachian State University. So during the summer of 1971, noted archaeologist Jean Carl Harrington, affectionately known as Pinky, uh, carried out a dig to try to find that elusive 18th century kitchen Instead, he and his, his, his team found a circa 1810 smokehouse just to the east and the south of the reconstructed kitchen. And I will note that Harrington was involved early on as an advisor to um, our archaeological work at Scotchtown. 1975 saw the last in this flurry of ar archaeological study, this time a dig of the late 18th century well house by Kendra M. Bonnet. Here are some snapshots of that excavation in progress. The well shaft itself still actually exists, but the structure that had surrounded it was no longer standing. Now to return to that 1820 JDG Brown plat, you can see it faintly illustrated in the bottom left corner, and I'll put that overlay up. So bottom left is actually labeled on this. The archeologists um, discovered that it was indeed a circa 1775 structure, about 20 by 20 feet with three walls that sheltered the well which again matches really well with this 1820 illustration. Among their discoveries was a fragment of an original white painted poplar weatherboard with a beaded edge that was in keeping with the siding on the main house. The artifact was recorded, but ultimately couldn't be preserved. Organic material like wood rarely survives in the archeological record. As one would expect, most of what is found at Scotchtown is ceramic, glass, or metal, objects that better resist decay. So besides these formal digs from 1968 to 1975, the landscape of Scotchtown often coughs up historic material just in the course of our everyday activities. Some is better documented than others. I am particularly amused by this fragment of a teacup that I came across in storage, which came with this note, picked up at random. <laughs> So we're working on, and we are developing, better practices. We're recording where we find objects um, at random around the, the site. And um, hopefully we will be able to add them to those layers of archaeological information that we already have in place. So we are absolutely delighted to have Dr. Elizabeth Fisher and her Randolph-Macon students working at Scotchtown, taking their professional lens to an important and understudied aspect of the grounds, the south side which was likely the formal approach to the house. And now it is my pleasure to pass things on to Dr. Fisher. I have pre-recorded a PowerPoint for you with my students. And so we will play that first and then I'll be available for questions. Hello, thank you very much for the invitation to speak about our work as archeologists at Scotchtown. Randolph-Macon College is very pleased to have been invited to participate in the research of this historic home. We had three main goals. The first, to add some small amount of knowledge about a significant historic American home, specifically uses of the front yard. Also to train students in the aims and practices of archeology span in a field school and to engage the imagination of all of you when it comes to the future of the past. You begin, of course, with a search of what we already know. 
you've been shown this watercolor drawing which I had not seen except as a black and white print in a book called The Old Homes of Hanover County, Virginia. But it doesn't give us very much information about exactly where we are. What should we imagine as the uses of this property seen here from a drone photo from the air? Should we imagine a fairly modest layout to Scotchtown? something like Kippax Plantation in Hopewell, Virginia, dating to around the same time as Scotchtown? Or should we imagine something a bit grander, such as on this oil and wood painting of unknown artists in the Metropolitan Museum in New York? Could it be that there were different phases of approaches to the yard in Scotchtown, and that we might be able to uncover a number of different uses and changes to the access to the building. As all good archaeologists do, we began our study in books and in archives at the Library of Congress and the Department of Historic Resources, looking at various kinds of homes that might be comparable to an 18th century home in Virginia. In particular, we looked at John Michael Vlack's Back of the Big House, which is an excellent and scholarly study of the architecture of the enslaved populations on plantations, particularly residences and work areas. We ask ourselves whether we should expect Scotch Town to present itself as a rather modest plantations such as Sutterly Plantation in Hollywood, Maryland, with an informal pathway and informal gardens? Or were we expecting something much more Palladian and formal, such as the Mount Airy Plantation in Warsaw, Virginia? This plantation also had very carefully laid out gardens. And we did have some information that there was a plan to make stately gardens at Scotchtown. We looked at landscape plans drawn up in about 1970 for a reinstallment of very nice gardens at Scotchtown. We looked closely at these for the drainage and access plans that had been laid out. Well, modern archaeology has a tool that didn't exist in the past, and that's satellites. So we looked at Google Earth and rectified the best we could the Google Earth view of Scotchtown with the legal property lines. And I've removed the plan and drawn the lines to show where we are. And that gave us the opportunity to examine the property and the roads and think about what would the access be to this house? How would you get there? Roads are very persistent. They are very conservative and rarely move. So we examined the house and we thought about how one would get to the house. What would be the possible access routes? Now, there could be a direct road right up to the house, but horses are hard to put in reverse. So chances are really good. There was some kind of circular path in the yard, or perhaps two paths that veer off on either side of the house to go back to the work areas. Or another possibility might be some kind of elliptical driveway on one side of the house or the other. And these are the most common access routes we saw on the different plans of um, 18th century and 19th century homes that we examined in the classroom. We went back to the landscaping plan one more time and decided on our approach. We would lay a series of trenches along the straight road that led up to the house. And we would lay a series of trenches perpendicular to that road to see if we encountered any paths or buildings or features of any type. So here are the first trenches we placed in 2018 and in 2019 we place trenches along the yellow line. 
It's obvious that the Google Earth picture was taken sometime in 2018 because the satellite picture of Scotchtown that's presently on Google Earth actually still shows our trenches from 2018. You can see that here, here, and here all in a straight line along the road. That still doesn't tell us exactly where we are. So one of our students who has some expertise in GIS plotted the points for triangulation of our trenches and grid pattern. Then we created a plan of these points which we would use for three dimensional measurement of the site, as well as laying out our first trenches. And once we established our trenches, we used a drone to take photographs and keep track of progress on a daily basis. So I'd like to talk for a minute about the process of archaeology and how we worked at Scotchtown. First of all, what we were doing is different than what is usually done in American archaeology. I would say the vast majority of archaeology done in the United States is what is called contract archaeology. It is often done because a law mandates some kind of surveillance for an area of potential effect. And that law could be the National Historic Preservation Act section 106 or could be local or state laws it is often done fast with a sense that something is going to be developed or some change is going to be made to a property and potential impact has to be assessed very quickly the reports go to the client not to the public and often we don't hear about those re results this is a very normal process in the United States. Not much done in Europe, uh, partly because a shovel test pit wouldn't find anything in Greece or someplace where the remains may be meters and meters deep. I would say the one problem with contract archaeology is that the goal of the client is frequently not to find anything to try not to find something, because if something is found, that might stop the development or the new building or the new road or whatever it is uh, that is intended to be built. What we were doing is different than this, and Preservation Virginia allows this on their properties because they actually own the properties. This is research archeology. span In research archeology, span you ask a question what is going on in the front yard of Scotchtown at different phases in the life of the house? You lay out trenches or survey grids and you dig until the question is answered or until the money runs out. And then you produce some kind of report which could be a scholarly publication. We're very fortunate that that's the type of archeology span we're doing at Scotchtown. With the freedom to do research archaeology, we chose to follow the University of Cambridge test pit digging guide and lay out a series of one meter square test trenches on a grid in the yard. It says it's an easy 20 steps, but since you have to repeat steps 8 through 16 multiple times, it's really a lot slower than it looks. All kinds of archaeology require training. Randolph-Macon College has established an archaeological studies major and minor program to train our students in fieldwork, in archaeological law, and in theoretical approaches to research questions. We begin with laboratory exercises at the college. For instance, I build trenches in dishpans. These are stratified layers with a, a tomb, a house, a shrine, and a road on top. And the students have to dig them layer by layer and make records and keep track of what they're doing. The students enjoy the camaraderie and team building exercises that are required for archaeology. 
less so the record keeping and extensive note taking that is absolutely essential for archaeology. This is just one of several labs that we do before we get into the field because it's absolutely essential that students know how to keep records and make drawings. So when we get to the field, the first thing they have to do is some geometry. How do you lay out a trench that's one meter square with right angles? It's a little bit trigonometry, a little Pythagorean theorem involved. And often students spend an entire day getting their corners exactly square. They also learn to read a line level, a spirit level. Often for the first time, many of them have never done this before because they need to take elevations so that we can have a three-dimensional record of our trenches. And then they remove the topsoil and we're off. Another process is learning to use tools. It's a little harder to do at the college, so I'm grateful for the opportunity to do it in the field. Trowels, for instance, require some training. We also use small picks, which you can see on the ground there uh, beside the student. Often students are hesitant at first to use the tools, but after a while they get into it. It's hard work and it requires patience, strength, and also good eyesight. You have to really look at what you're doing so that you can watch for any changes in the color of the soil or of course any artifacts you might encounter. One of the things I like most is the fact that students build confidence doing this. Within a week or so, the students are working independently, actively, working hard, and my job is basically to fetch things for them and answer any particular questions, but I get to stay out of the way while they develop their skills and become archaeologists. We always laugh that you can't get a college student to sweep their room, but I can have them spend eight weeks sweeping dirt. They will tell you I'm very crabby, about keeping the edges straight on the trenches, what we call swimming pool edges. And this is something we insist on for good record keeping. So here you see a trench that's pretty good and one that has very straight edges so that you can actually see the layers of clay, subsoil and topsoil in the profile under the meter stick. All of the dirt is dry sifted in boxes. We put down tarps and set up the sifters so that the students can retrieve the dirt later for refilling the trenches. And again, this requires a bit of strength and also patience as you move the dirt and sift in it for any artifacts you might have missed. From time to time, something shows up and we get very excited when they can actually find that tiny piece of pottery that they missed while digging. We miss very, very little because of the dry sifting. Record keeping is really the whole game. Uh, on Scotchtown's lawn, we did not have to lay out a very large grid, but we certainly do keep track of where the trenches are and use a template to write in our journals every day about what we've done and where we found everything. Some sites nowadays use electronic recording devices such as iDig. I certainly use this in Greece and it might be nice at Scotchtown in the future. But right now we've used composition notebooks and a template that is the same on every page to make sure every student is following exactly the same order of recording. And then the elevations are kept, how deep we are, what we found, the color and type of soil, and any artifacts that have been encountered. And they are definitely encouraged to be neat. Not all of them are, uh, but the notebooks are very important because next year's students will use last year's notebooks. 
We also use daily photographs, both on the ground and by drone, to make certain we're keeping track of the trenches and the progress. And if we encounter an artifact, we also take photographs and have special tools, which the students then love to run and get so they can remove whatever the artifact is. And that the excitement is just tremendous whenever something is encountered here, at the bottom of a wine bottle. And you can see the care with which the student is removing this broken piece of glass uh, from the soil. Students map the location of every artifact and generally take a photograph, put it, write a tag, and put it in a special plastic bag for processing in the laboratory later. Of course, some artifacts are very special. We found the horseshoe. You get a sense of how excited the student is to be able to remove this from the ground. And then the final process is to make drawings. Every student has to make drawings both of the plan of the trench and also of the elevation or sides of the wall of the trench, the different colors of soil. This often is very time consuming and difficult for them to make scale drawings absolutely accurately. And so they spend a great deal of time measuring and marking and creating their drawings. And those usually turn out pretty good so that we have a good sense of where everything was found and what is important about each trench. So the students learn to use the tools, they learn to use the methodology, and they learn the excitement of archaeology. But they also learn the hard work because after the trenches are finished, or the season has ended, they have to shovel all the dirt back into the wheelbarrows and refill the trenches. Well, what did we find and what do we do next? Of course, we found numerous pieces of glass and rusted nails and brick and mortar, all the sorts of things one would find on a colonial or 19th century homestead. A few of them are interesting, cartridges from a gun, perhaps a, an inkwell, a seashell, a oyster shell. Each unit that we dig is separately cataloged, photographed, and important pieces are drawn. Here you have a typical collection from one of the trenches, pieces of brick and mortar, pieces of the lawn tractor, nails, glass, and some pottery as well. And the individual pieces of pottery will be separated out and studied at a later time. Important pieces are cataloged separately and drawn. These will be marked out and labeled as deserving extra study in a later session. We also bring conservators to the field to study anything that is special, such as our horseshoe. And one of my conservators is working on horseshoes right now and has recorded a moment of information about her current project. Once artifacts are discovered and removed from an archaeological site, object conservation becomes a primary focus. The goal of conservators is to prolong the integrity of art or artifacts so that they can be studied in the future as scholarship changes and new information arises. Conservators use various tools to analyze the chemical composition of materials or paints, the structure of an object, and can verify whether an artifact is fake. For example, this horseshoe would be evaluated using a radiograph to determine the extent of cracking throughout the structure. Depending on the condition, a manual cleaning process would take place to remove the corrosion. Analysis using mass spectroscopy or other chemical instrumentation could be employed to determine the composition of the iron alloy within the horseshoe. If the structural integrity of the horseshoe was determined to be too fragile for this process, no cleaning would take place. Sometimes the best thing to do for an artifact is nothing at all. By now you're probably asking, so did you find anything what does it mean? 
What did we learn? Well, some of what we learned was fairly prosaic. We found, for instance, this planting pit with the wire from the planting ball still there. We saved it, of course. What did we learn from this? We learned the garden store is correct. You should dig your hole at least twice as large as the planting ball before you plant the bush. I don't think this one made it. We found roots of trees and irrigation lines. Of course, we left those in place. One of the diggers would like to tell you about the discovery of a potential feature. In this picture, I'm digging with one of our site supervisors, Andrew. This picture captures a really exciting moment from the dig because we discovered cobbles embedded in the clay in an unnatural, likely man-made placement. We believe the cobbles to be a part of the roadbed at Scotchtown. The layer of clay and cobbles that we uncovered could be a feature. We were not able to pursue excavation of this further and we've been delayed by circumstances, but I hope we'll get back to it soon. What could it be? I don't know. It could be nothing or it could be a road. Many colonial roads were created by embedding gravel or cobbles in layers of clay. That in and of itself would not necessarily constitute a road, but there's something beside the road in another trench that makes me convinced we might be on the right track. We found the horseshoe and the wine bottle and a pipe stem in a single narrow area, which is probably a ditch. Where would you find artifacts? along the road, you'd find them in the ditch. So perhaps we have uncovered a feature, but at the moment we don't know. We will have to pursue it at a later time. The students worked really hard and they had a great time. Some of them have gone on to jobs in archaeology and one of them would like to tell you about a particular adventure she had on the dig. Hi, I'm Morgan Lindsay, a history and archaeology double major from Randolph-Macon's class of 2022. I dug at Scotchtown in the spring of 2019 for Dr. Fisher's archaeological methods course. I was able to learn so much from digging at Scotchtown, and the entire experience was amazing. In this picture, I'm posing with a new friend I made on the dig. When we would close up at the end of the day, we put down tarps and laid pieces of cinder block or brick over them to keep them in place and to protect the trenches underneath. On this particular day, I looked down at the cinder block I was carrying and a black snake popped its head out at me. When I picked up the cinder block, I hadn't even noticed that there was a snake napping inside. So I got the cinder block in place took a picture with the snake, and we let it wander away to find another place to sleep. And I thank my team very much for all of the hard work they put in. And I thank Scotchtown very much for the opportunity they've given to Randolph-Macon College students. Thank you. Well, snakes, poison ivy, allergies, sunshine, the, the job of an archaeologist. It's not an easy oh, one. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, we have a couple questions that have come through in um, the chat and in the Q&A box. So keep them coming. If there's anything that you are curious about, we are all ears and we're an open book. I'm happy to talk about it. Um, Don, there's one that, that I think you might have a good understanding of. Um, do you know much about the larger farming operations beyond Scotchtown's workyard and what that might have been like? Yes. So um, when Mr. Henry lived here, uh, he had a, a, a thousand acres um, of the original uh, property. And it is my understanding that there were three separate farms um, on this acreage growing mostly wheat and tobacco. Um, and so uh, they would have uh, been also fairly uh, independent as far as having 
uh, gardens, uh, kitchen gardens, um, growing uh, food for the family here, um, livestock and that type of thing as well. All right. Just one more moment. Just give me just a tiny bit of trouble here. <laughs> While Lee is doing that, I can answer a couple of questions that have come through our chat box. Um, one was uh, asking if Dorothea Dandridge was related to Martha Dandridge. And yes, they were cousins. Um, and another question was about the naming of Scotchtown. Uh, Charles Chisel used many uh, skilled laborers of Scots descent. Um, in his iron manufactory and in creating a town of these laborers, um, we, we believe that the name of Scott's town uh, stuck and over the course of time became Scotch Town. Thank you. Excellent. Um, let's see here. I have a question asking if there's any upcoming projects planned. So a little bit of that is, is up to COVID. Um, in this, this year, it's been kind of a um, wait and see kind of thing. Um, but Dr. Fisher, do you want to speak to that? Well, I certainly hope we're back in the field in the fall. That would be the plan. I'm, I'm very hopeful that we can do another field season in the fall. We'll have to see what happens because, you know, they change their minds every day about what's safe. But being outside in the in the field shouldn't be that big a problem. So I'm very hopeful. And I understand that there's a master plan being put together for Scotchtown as well to look at the broader population. And we're very interested in participating in that. Wonderful. Yeah, the, the master plan uh, that Dr. Fisher referred to is a huge part of what we're up to at Scotchtown right now. You know, Scotchtown is more than just the house. It's the, you know, the remains of the outer buildings. It's the whole plantation system. And there's so much that we need to dig into there. Um, and so we are in the process of planning for that and um, digging into the scholarship and making connections. Um, and so if any of you guys want to weigh in on this, and if you wanna be part of that process, we would love to talk to you. Um, this is a community you know, process um, and we're we're really, we're really excited about it. And Dr. Fisher, you guys are absolutely part of that. <laughs> A key part of it is also, you know, making sure that we are representing the presence of the enslaved on this property. Um, they are such an integral part of what happened here. And um, although, you know, we call it Patrick Henry Scotchtown, um, their lives are entwined with it. And so archaeology can be especially helpful in making sure that we um, have material links to those people. Um, so. Uh, stay tuned. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Hopefully we can find in that road and that road leads us somewhere else and it's going to be great. <laughs> I also have a suggestion for what to do if you encounter poison ivy. Um, yes. So apparently to tech new lotion before and after. So I learned something new today. <laughs> uh, let's see here. What's coming through? A question that often comes up is whether we're going to be putting some of these findings on display for the public. That's a great question. Um, we have a few of them on display now, actually. Um, so if you come to Scotchtown, we have sort of a museum space. Um, for example, the, the, the part of the uh, Pearlware platter that I, I had up, that's on display right now, um, and a few other select objects. I think it would be fabulous to continue processing these artifacts, get them out on display. They are such um, an evocative link to the history of Scotchtown. Um, so you know, as we work through this master planning process, I'm into it, so. I'd like to add that it would be nice to do more scientific testing on the brick and mortar, the elemental analyses of some of the materials that may have been made right there on site. And I know there are many chemistry students who are in our archaeology program who are heading for a conservation school. And they're always looking for projects of things to analyze. So bits of mortar or bits of brick, maybe bits of metal, 
um, might be something that they could work on in the future. Well, I know that our uh, architectural preservation specialist, Eric Litchford, who I think is on this uh, webinar, would be delighted with that. Um, and in fact, there we've been recently doing some research on um, some ledgers associated with Patrick Henry. And so we're understanding more about what might have been the paint colors and what kind of ingredients were involved in that. So there's all sorts of scientific analysis that we need to do. So we'll be in touch. And that's, that's the great thing about these sites. You know, we may go into it for the history, um, but we bring in trigonometry and we bring in uh, <laughs> scientific analysis. And um, that's what makes it so interesting. Our archaeology kind of brings all those together. Mm -hmm. Dr. Fisher, we had a viewer ask if visitors are allowed to watch your students and uh, you when you are performing your digs uh, here at Scotchtown. Absolutely. As long as the Scotchtown Museum allows it, we allow it, definitely. We're more or less a part of the show when we're in the field. And so we're, and we're happy to be that. We're happy. And it, it puts the students in a position of needing to know some of the history. They're asked questions. And so they have to do their homework before they're in the field, which is wonderful. Well, I guarantee you, when they get back in the field, it's not if, um, <laughs> when they get back out there, you will know via any of our social media platforms. And I invite you definitely to check those out to see what's going on. This weekend at Scotchtown, there's an amazing textile event. Um, Don, what are they working on this weekend? Uh, this weekend, we're going to be featuring natural dyeing techniques from the 18th century on wool and other fibers. Um, we will be doing uh, three different dye pots, I believe, uh, to produce three different colors. And the uh, Clothos hand spinners uh, will be uh, demonstrating that, that process. Fabulous. And this has been a series starting early April with the shearing of, of uh, Lady McFluffer face, our, <laughs> our, one of our resident sheeps, uh, sheep. <laughs> so um, definitely invite you to come out there and, and keep, keep an ear to the ground. There's a lot of great things happening at Scotchtown. I'm sorry to say that we've come to the end of our time together today, but if you have any further questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. And again, we thank you for joining us. And Dr. Fisher, thank you for the work you've done and pass on our best to your students as well. Um, thank you, I will. Thank you. Grateful. Thank right, you, well, everyone. Everyone take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.